over 200,000 employed Hoosiers have active substance use disorder today in the workforce. And when we look at the concerns that businesses have, retention and talent are among the top concerns facing any business right now anywhere in America. And I think our employers here in Indiana have been very vocal about workforce development being something that they need solutions for. That's Mike Thibodeau. He's the director of Indiana Workforce Recovery, a key program of the Indiana Chamber of Commerce's Wellness Council of Indiana. We'll hear how Mike and his team are helping Hoosier employers address the challenges of employees who struggle with substance misuse and abuse with a new approach and mindset, and how Mike's personal testimony is a recovery success story in itself on the Hopeful Hoosier podcast, episode 11. I'm your host, Andy Dix. As an executive coach, I work with business leaders and entrepreneurs daily. Two of their most common concerns are the recruitment and retention of high quality employees here in Indiana. Finding and keeping talented people is getting harder and harder given the rise in substance misuse and abuse. Executives are often frustrated by the long and costly recruitment process that must start all over again when a candidate fails a required new hire drug screen. Hoosier business leaders often feel trapped by a zero-tolerance alcohol and drug use policy that can cost them a top employee who's maybe found to be intoxicated while at work. Until very recently, Indiana employers were encouraged to play it safe and enforce these strict policies with little regard to extenuating circumstances. Now, thanks to Indiana's Governor Eric J. Holcomb's leadership, in 2018, he signed the House Enrollment Act 1007, authorizing the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration to create best practice guidelines for employers to implement a second chance program for applicants and current employees who are qualified for work but test positive on a drug screen. This law is an excellent first step but Indiana's employers need practical help to navigate these challenging changes successfully. So the state of Indiana partnered with the Indiana Chamber affiliates, the Wellness Council of Indiana, and Indiana Workforce Recovery to develop guidelines to help employers and employees understand and address substance misuse and substance abuse disorder appropriately. I wanted to learn more about this unique second chance program and how it's providing hope for both employers and Hoosier employees and their families. Because for many people, substance misuse and substance abuse is a significant problem that's hiding in plain sight. I sat down with Mike Thibodeau in the eighth floor conference room of the Indiana Chamber's offices in downtown Indianapolis to talk about this new second chance approach and learned quickly that Mike himself is a beneficiary of employers willing to give someone struggling with substance abuse disorder a second chance. You see, Mike is in long-term recovery himself. Why don't we paint the picture of what the problem is? So when we look at the nature of who is suffering from substance use disorder and who are, who are individuals living with active substance use disorder, the majority of those individuals are currently employed. But when we look at those demographics, right now we our data projects that, combined with SAMHSA and federal data, projects that over 200,000 employed Hoosiers have active substance use disorder today in the workforce. And when we look at the concerns that businesses have, retention and talent are among the top concerns facing any business right now anywhere in America. And I think our employers here in Indiana have been very vocal about workforce development being something that they need solutions for. So if we're looking at over 200,000 Hoosiers who are currently a part of the workforce suffering from substance use disorder, we then take the fact that if in the state of Indiana you fail a drug screen, you're as likely to be terminated as you are to be referred to any treatment or education. That means that there are a lot of employees just being cycled out of businesses who are already qualified to work there. We also have a lot of employers who report that individuals are failing drug screens when applying for positions. And so we need to provide Hoosier employers with creative solutions that allow them to adapt to this reality and also become an active part of the solution. Because we know that employers being equipped to intervene saves lives. So among all the referral sources for care for substance use disorder, an employer referral has the highest outcomes at one in five year abstinence based measures and also has the lowest self perceived need for care among that population, which means that those individuals who are referred to care via their employer 
most often wouldn't have gone into treatment if it hadn't been their employer that recommended that they do it. And that means that they're not at a point in their lives where they've necessarily hit bottom, which is, it's a fair, hitting bottom is a flawed narrative throughout because it paints a picture of you having to look like that person on the sidewalk or you're a stereotype of addiction or substance use when the reality is that much more of us do look like just your everyday neighbor, your everyday person that you interact, your coworker, um, who maybe isn't as social or engaged as they as you, as you think they are, or maybe who once in a while you think just parties a little bit too hard. That's the person who, when directed to the right quality of care and willing to participate in that quality of care, can actually achieve much better outcomes sooner uh, and not have to go all the way down. And that allows our employers to retain them in the workforce, keep them engaged, and in the end build what is a very grateful and reliable employee. You use the term substance use disorder. Most people call that addiction. Correct. What, what do you see as the difference and, and what would you define as substance use disorder? Uh, so there is no difference between substance use disorder and addiction. It's simply the non-stigmatic and medically appropriate way to talk about addiction. So we try to, when we think about the word addiction, there's a lot of stigma that enters into our brain and a lot of it, an image that enters into our head that doesn't necessarily pertain to somebody who's dealing with a chronic condition. And that chronic condition is substance use disorder. I think that there is a difference between substance use disorder and substance misuse, meaning that substance misuse is, is recreational voluntary misuse of a substance. Many people we, we all know participate in that, whether it's just binge drinking every once in a while or um, people who recreationally use a substance of one kind or another. But individuals who have substance use disorder have a diagnosable chronic condition of physical and or cognitive dependence on a substance. Here in Indiana, what are our substances of choice to abuse the most? Uh, so most frequent is alcohol, alcohol everywhere. Anywhere you go, alcohol is by far number one. Um, one of the things that's not often talked about a lot is the fact that for as many people as opioids are taking away from our, our families and our society and the problems that they're causing, for decades alcohol has been at those levels. But it's more of our social normative behavior at this point, so it's not necessarily as focused on. Next to that would definitely be marijuana. When we look at especially failed drug test rates or the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, marijuana is nowhere near where alcohol is, but it's definitely leading the pack as far as uh, illicit drug use goes. And then third would be methamphetamines. That's commonly referred to as, as meth. Right now we have an issue in Indiana and, and all across America where methamphetamines are no longer, meth is no longer being made in a trailer or a lab in somebody's garage. It's now being brought in from other countries. It's much more potent and it's way cheaper than it's ever been, especially as individuals move away from opioids because of the common, now what is now common perception of how dangerous it is, and with fentanyl making it much more scary to uh, use illicit opioids. Methamphetamine is becoming a, a drug of choice for even more people than it was before, but when we look at failed test rates, meth is definitely third, followed by, I believe, cocaine, and then certain types of opioids. When we are surrounded here in the state with more and more states that are legalizing marijuana for recreational use. Uh, what, from your perspective in the role that, that you play, what's your take on what the future could hold if Indiana goes down that same route? There are a lot of concerns about marijuana legalization and even, I will say, medical legalization. So the first of which is the fact that there is no such thing as a prescription for marijuana. You do not have a doctor's notification that you are allowed to use it. What happens is you are provided with a recommendation from your doctor, and then you go and you fill that recommendation at a distributor, whatever they want to call it. And then let's say you go to take your workplace drug test, your medical review officer or your drug testing service is gonna say, okay, you tested positive for marijuana, and you go, oh, well, I have a prescription, and they go, no, you don't, you have a recommendation. They have to then report to the employer that you tested positive for marijuana, in your system, and then it's on the employer to decide what they have to do with you, which is completely different from how any legitimate legal prescription is handled. Putting that onus on the employer in that way creates a lot of liability concerns. It shifts it where it shouldn't be. And beyond that, we also know that individuals in states where recreational marijuana is legal are using and are actively intoxicated at work. There are published studies showing very frequent self-reported rates of use and intoxication in the workplace in those states where recreational marijuana is legal. And there was a study that occurred between, I believe it was 2007 and 2011, showing that states with medical marijuana had a 25% reduced incidence of opioid overdoses. 
However, that's a flawed narrative because that same study was done between 2011 and 2017, and those same sites all had a 25% increase over those states that did not have medical legalization. So from the employer stance, I see no reason that a business community would ever be in favor of legalization. That's just my personal view. That's the chamber's stance is also against the legalization of marijuana in any form right now. And that's in partnership with the governor's office and with the direct input of the business community of the state. Personally, I will say as a person who, you know, marijuana was a substance that I did abuse, it caused a lot of problems for me in my life and also was part of a bigger problem, which was that I was addicted to escape. So when I think about you know why I use and those things like that, I was escaping trauma, I was escaping insecurity, I was escaping a number of things that were causing me to never feel comfortable in my own skin. Loneliness was a big part of that. And any substance for me that produced that euphoric feeling, that artificial stimulation of those natural receptors in my brain that made me feel good was just a bigger part of the problem. When individuals try to paint marijuana legalization as a harm reduction measure, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not there. It's not in the same category as MAT because it produces a euphoric effect. And that's, I think, an important distinction. So what I'm hearing is the, the underlying issues of trying to resolve pain, trying to resolve trauma, trying to resolve the perception of chronic stress, et cetera, if we're choosing this sort of counterfeit substitution of a substance to anesthetize the feeling, it's not solving the issues. Correct. Yeah. Individuals who have issues with those same things that I mentioned, they need to be participating in therapy, introducing new coping mechanisms into their life. They need to be building healthy social behaviors and moving that reliance from one substance to another is not necessarily going to produce that effect. The other thing that happens very frequently, at least anecdotally for me in my experience has been that individuals I see who enter into recovery who think I can use marijuana eventually in the same way that all substances those of us who are in recovery or who have a disorder use eventually it stops producing that euphoric effect and then we move on to something that does and that's not to provide any validation or invalidation to the gateway narrative but it's much more uh, an effect of we're avoiding the real problems that are going on and, and and i see that when i look even at the demogra the health demographics of the state of indiana we have social determinants of health that are in just the bottom of the barrel. We look at a study of individuals that's been done over the course of the last year and a half, I believe, of over 1.5 million Hoosiers who are receiving services through FSSA, the Family and Social Services Administration. And we saw that 62% of those people have food instability, 41% have job instability, 40% have a fear of housing loss. Think about how if you're unable to deal with those basic necessities, like if over half of our people who are receiving social supports are still dealing with chronic food instability, then we have issues where people might need to feel like they have to escape from that. And that might be where they turn to those substances. And that's where providing another method of them to get intoxicated legally is, is a huge problem. But more than anything, especially with marijuana, there has to be research. There needs to be a reasonable measure of intoxication. You have to be able to tell if somebody's intoxicated in the workplace. If you couldn't tell scientifically if people were drunk at work, think about how dangerous that would be. And that's the same point that I often make to people about marijuana is if we can't tell as a society if you're intoxicated while driving, intoxicated while using heavy equipment, intoxicated while performing a myriad of safety sensitive tasks, how can we realistically put that burden on our employer community and say they have to be able to deal with that when there's no science telling them how they can? It's a quandary for businesses and for the community because the public perception is moving towards legalization. It, eventually, it will happen. But we need right now, we, don't, we, we are not in a position, I don't think, as Indiana to want to be another test case of that. So tell us about how the program is trying to address this issue and, and what is the, the chamber's response to this growing problem here in the state? The response has been to really, one, avoid duplication. So we are very committed and intentional in working with the governor's office to not be reproducing programs that already exist. 
So uh, just a simple example of that is I'm not going to build a training program specific to individuals in recovery when there are a myriad of state-supported training programs and industry-supported training programs that those individuals can participate in. They're just not presently connected to them. The other response has been to focus on kind of tiering the levels of it, businesses that we're capable of engaging with. So when I started here in October, my first charge that I gave myself on day one was there are businesses in the state of Indiana who want to be part of the solution, who want to improve their policies, who want to have better internal mechanisms tomorrow. Let's do everything we can possibly do to help those businesses that are motivated to do work now be able to do it. Because we're getting calls from our HR helpline all the way to our different business services saying, I've got somebody who needs help. I have no idea what to do. I'm just using Google. With that, we produced a now, what is now a live five-part 60-minute-plus video toolkit specific to Indiana employers that they can go through to kind of get a little bit of a deep dive on certain topics that are necessary for having a best practice policy and workplace. We also built a series, an event series that occurred around the state. We had eight events between January and April and we had over 350 employers engage in those events. And through those events, we talked to them about signs and symptoms. What does it look like when somebody's using? We provided some of the science behind substance use disorder. So that way, from a stigma standpoint, people can't leave those events or that conversation reasonably being able to ask, well, why can't they just stop? And I feel, at least for me, that's the moment that stigma breaks down the, the most, is when you go from being somebody who says, well, they just need to stop, to, okay, I understand why they can't. Now let's help them. And how do we get an employer in the state that says, well, if they can't stop, that's not my problem, that's their problem, they have to leave? And we term them instead of getting them treatment. So that's a, a very, complicated question. I will say so far we have worked to definitely let businesses know the effects and the cost of letting people go. But for the most part, there are so many businesses that do want to build the right kind of workplaces and the right kind of solutions that we have primarily been focused on that in our first year. I remember back when I worked on political campaigns, they would tell us that like something equivalent of for every $1 you spend getting somebody that already has the right attitude to do, some, to do what you want them to do, you have to spend $100 to get somebody that doesn't agree with you or is on the fence to agree with you. And then you have to invest in still spending that dollar to get them to do what you want even once they're on board. So kind of taking that mindset for this job, I've taken the approach of we need to help employers who have the right attitudes make the right investment today. The other thing is helping them is framing it from a workforce development standpoint. 86% of our businesses in Indiana, I believe, identify workforce development as a top concern that's facing their business, according to a Chamber Foundation survey. And if we can tap into that and let them know that, hey, there's a lot of people that you're letting go right now that you can retain, we can provide you with an, an evidence-based method of retaining them. Through state legislation, you have civil liability, so you cannot be, a, a, no negligent hiring can be alleged against you. And also, if they do have to participate in treatment, you can either help pay for all or some of that. And if you want to, you can then have a mutual agreement with that employee to participate in a wage assignment, which then allows the employer and the employee to kind of either share the costs or over time pay back costs. Because I will say that even as an employed individual, I was employed when I entered into treatment, even though even meeting the deductible was a very challenging task for me at that time. And, and participation in treatment is very costly. Through my journey, I, it was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, I wanna say somewhere over $30,000 that me and my family and my support system ended up investing in my recovery. And that's a very substantial investment for anybody to be able to make. This is a challenge that affects all levels of organizations. It's not just a line level problem. It goes right up to the CEOs and boards of directors. Uh, substance use, abuse is a chronic issue. And, and how does the chamber recognize that? The person we're trying to reach to utilize the program for their business may be someone who actually needs to utilize the program themselves. We're very forward about the fact that substance use disorder is not, does not discriminate. That's actually a big part of the reason that I tell my story as much as I do, is that when I got into treatment and when I got into recovery, I'm a college graduate, I'm an Eagle Scout, I was on the board of my parish, 
I am a state champion high school athlete. I have been gainfully employed throughout, I was gainfully employed throughout my entire addiction experience. And I at no point looked like somebody who was going through that kind of struggle. But at the same time, I had issues in, inside of me that were preventing me from fully actualizing and realizing my potential and from having any semblance of a happiness that wasn't artificially stimulated. The amount of isolation, depression, and loneliness in my life was very high. And I think that when we're looking at engaging with companies, what you need to make sure of is that if you're going to have a culture where you're drug testing or you're doing any sort of identification or prevention-based behavior, we, we want to see people engaging at all levels in those programs because people need to believe that it's a top-down decision and that it's a, it's a cultural attitude. And that kind of goes for well-being and wellness in, in general. You need to be seeing that the people who are in leadership care about these things and not think of, oh, like financial wellness is just something that the people on the front line have to deal with. This is something that everybody has to care about. Volunteerism is in that same way. So it, it maintains well with just general cultural norms for productive and su successful work environments. But it is difficult to get people who are more quote unquote successful to recognize that they have a problem because they're not going to look at their own life and say, I need help. They're going to look at their life like I did even and say, sure, I drink too much. Sure, I'm using drugs too much, but I'm fine. It's not affecting anything else. And if somebody's in that boat, it's not on us to tell them you have to go to into a particular type of treatment or anything like that. As for as many individuals who have issues with substance misuse, there are just as many people that self-correct and moderate or stop using altogether just through their own free will as there are who go through a formalized treatment process. From a chamber's perspective then, when we look at recovering sort of lost employees in the workforce to get them back to being productive, at what point do we think this is just throwing good money after bad people? Is there a place where the people have to want to help themselves before you know any other program or anything is going to work? So they hired me, so they're definitely not like, <laughs> throwing good money after bad people or whatever that you said. I don't think that that's a narrative that I see in any part of our culture here. I think that there are people who do think that way. They're prob I'm sure there are people who think that way that are part of the business community. However, we saw you know, in, our, in our most recent you know, statistically relevant survey, over 96% of our employer leadership believe that addiction is a community problem. That same number nationally for the general populations in the 50s. On the whole, our business community agrees that this is a problem to an even greater degree than the general population does. We saw in the same way that over 70% of our uh, employers believe that addiction is a chronic disease that should be managed like any other chronic condition. Now, the policies and behaviors don't necessarily line up with that yet, but we believe that that's because there just hasn't been a successful roadmap to get there. One thing that we've done in, in cooperation with many other industry partners in the state and Governor Holcomb's administration is through House Enrolled Act 1007, which passed in the 2018 session, we now have a method where individuals who apply for a job but who fail a drug test and are qualified can now get directed towards treatment and then return to that job that they've been offered. And that's something that's really important because right now only 6% of businesses do that, where they will feel comfortable hiring somebody who's previously failed a test and then participated in treatment and comes back and, and can test negative on that and, ha and have a successful screen. We're doing whatever we can to make sure that businesses know that this is a population worth engaging. Relapse and remission uh, and setbacks are a very real part of this disease. What I'm looking for right now as I engage with businesses and what evidence-based best practice shows is we just want them to provide a second chance. After that, they should have absolutely policies that hold individuals accountable for their behaviors and actions. What I always recommend to, my business, to businesses that I work with is, and this is stealing the words of one of my favorite legal counsels that we work with as well, is just substitute the word diabetes for addiction or for substance use disorder and then think about how you would manage the situation then. So if somebody's violent in the workplace and they had diabetes, would you terminate them? Yes. So that's what you should do. Uh, if somebody stole or committed fraudulent behavior, you would take the necessary disciplinary action. However, if somebody was chronically late for a few weeks straight and then you were having a performance review and it came up that they, had, they were dealing with some unmanaged diabetes or another unmanaged chronic health condition, 
the vast majority of employers that we talk to, really actually every employer I talk to would help that person with their problem and work to do whatever they could to retain them. And that's the exact same thing that we want employers to do in this instance. Can you share with us the, the actual mission statement that you operate under? So our mission is to empower the business community to play a lead role by educating and guiding employers through the steps they can take to help their workers. If I'm an employer, what's the real face of substance abuse disorder look like? What am I looking for? And how would I even maybe become aware that someone that's sitting in my conference room needs assistance? I think that the primary indicator of need is a alteration of behavior. So if you suddenly have somebody who used to be very social, who is now no longer participating in those types of environments, if you have somebody who used to meet all their deadlines who now is not, you have somebody who used to never call out sick who now is using up all their sick time immediately every single month and with unexplained absences. If you have somebody who, who suddenly is becoming more irritable, discontent, and, and seems to be having a, a change in their mannerisms or behavior, then what I would recommend at that point is that an employer begins an interactive conversation through their typical HR channels. And an important part of that is you can't, for the most part, and, and businesses should always consult with legal counsel on all this, directly ask, and ask somebody and say like, are you high right now? That's not a acceptable question to ask an employee. What you need to do is if somebody's showing up late to work, if somebody's having other performance related measures, you need to record those and document those every single time and say, here's what's going on. And then what you need to do is enter into a conversation with that individual where you're saying, hey, we've noticed these things is there anything we can do to help you do your job better? Is there anything you're dealing with that we can help you with? You never wanna come out as an employer and just say, you're dealing with substance use disorder, you're dealing with addiction, you're dealing with depression, you're dealing with whatever it may be, because that would produce an environment in which an individual would feel that it might be necessary to reveal a disability and they might feel pressured to do so. However, if you're asking somebody how you can assist them and they say, I've been having problems with alcohol or problems with drugs, then we want you to be able to say, okay, thank you very much for telling me this. Let's get you help now. What I always recommend for businesses is, and this is backed up by evidence-based best practice and our, and our legal counsels that we work with as well, is that you should have clear and consistent policies for what occurs during different types of circumstances. So I even recommend that a business in their break room or even having an HR person just walk in the floor let people know what will happen if they or somebody they know comes forward and asks for assistance voluntarily. And in many cases, for a lot of companies, that might have to be different than what happens if you fail a drug screen. And if that is different, you should say that. You should literally have two posters in the break room, one of which says, hey, if you want help, we will help you. Here's what exactly what will happen. Here's who you talk to. Here's what will happen the moment you disclose. Here's where the type of places we will try to have you go for treatment. And then also, right next to that, if it's different for a failed drug screen, here's what will happen if you fail a drug screen. It might be the same process, maybe it won't be, depending on the company and the regulations that you might be under, depending on industry codes and things like that. The other thing that I always recommend for people is, if you're an HR representative, you're a business owner, whoever, you should not have to be everything to everyone. You're not a social worker, you're not a counselor, don't make an assessment yourself of what level of care an individual needs but have a partner identified that you can refer an individual to for that formalized assessment. What that will do is that will make sure that an individual goes to a location, they get an appropriate level of care. If I'm an employer, what I would encourage you to do is have the employee sign a consent form so that way you can have direct conversations with their counselor and their counselor will already, uh, especially if you have a relationship with that center or with that place, only disclose appropriate information to you as an employer because they have a lot of very strict regulations on what they can tell people. But it's important for you as the employer to know when somebody's participating in treatment, if they're actually participating in the treatment. If the assessment center says, listen, my, let's use my own personal example, Mike, at the level that you're drinking and the substances that you're using, you need to participate in medication-assisted withdrawal, which is the proper way of saying detoxification in a hospitalized setting. It's important for me then to take that correct action instead of just saying, I don't think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go do this other thing instead because that shouldn't be acceptable to my employer either. I should be doing what 
the doctors tell me I need to do, what the assessment center tells me I need to do, because that's what it's going to take to, for me to go back and be a productive member of the workforce. There are insurance complications and things like that that have to enter into that conversation as well. But that's another area where the employer is equipped to serve as an advocate and say, hey, like, listen, like, we want this individual to continue participating and they can have conversations with their benefits managers and with the managers of their employee assistance programs to say, we want Tom, we need Tom to come back. He needs to participate in these things in order to return to work. And that's where you can start to have a little bit more of a, a collaborative environment that provides support. Because in the end, when we look at relapse prevention, studies show one of the primary drivers for preventing a setback, preventing a return to use is, well, one, trauma, dealing with trauma in a proper way. But along with that, it's the building and the maintaining of healthy reciprocal social relationships, meaning are building relationships in your life where I need you and you need me. And the workplace is a powerful environment for that. And if you're doing a good job with your employee engagement, employee engagement can be relapse prevention and can be recovery support because I will tell you that even in this environment, as a person who's in long-term recovery, I have a very keen sense that my employer needs me. Every job I've ever had, I've had a keen sense that my employer needs me, and I, and I know that I need them as well. And then you also build those same types of relationships in your social environments as well. The flip side of that, when we look at individuals who are predisposed for substance use disorder, is a reason why employee engagement can also serve as a method of preventing people from being predisposed to substance use disorder or to you know those types of behaviors because when an individual becomes isolated, what happens is the natural opioid receptors in their brain all of a sudden are starving. And where the majority of those interactions for those opioid receptors come for those of us that are healthy and in our everyday lives is during healthy social behaviors. When I'm doing well at work, when you're, when you're holding your child and you get a natural rush that's the same receptors that provide a lot of the stimulation for an individual who's using. However, when an individual is starving for that because they're isolated, anything can be the best thing ever. And that's where that survival mechanism kicks in. I'm sure all of us can remember a time when we were super hungry and we had a piece of garbage fast food and it was like the best thing we've ever eaten in our entire lives. And it's that same thing to an even greater extent when you're starving because of isolation and all of a sudden your brain gets fed a opioid or alcohol or marijuana or any substance that produces that simulated effect, your brain all of a sudden says, whoa, that was awesome. Dude, that was the best thing we've ever had. Let's have way more of that. And then what happens over time is because those substances produce such a high artificial stimulus, it wears down those receptors to where it takes more and more and more and more and more in order to produce the same effect. And that not only applies to our substances that we're using, it applies to those same social relationships. And it means that individuals who are inactive substance use disorder often are so reliant on those substances that just feel normal that they don't get the same reward feelings that ordinary and healthy individuals do from work, from baby, from food, from family, from all of these things. And that's when an individual has to ask and say, why don't they care about their family? Why don't they care about their job? How do they not realize how they're hurting others? It's because the parts of their brain that are wired to make them care have been overridden and drowned. And the only thing that can make them care anymore is when they take that substance. So if I'm not an HR person, if I'm just running a business or uh, I'm an executive. What resources does the Wellness Council offer to help me help my employees? I would still heavily recommend the video toolkit. The guidelines are a great resource for auditing and implementing uh, best practices within your work environment. And beyond that, you can always shoot me an email, give me a call, contact us here at the Wellness Council. We provide strategic consultations for businesses on this topic, but then also on things like diabetes, obesity, smoking cessation. We will do direct consultations to firms with very knowledgeable staff members and help them realize what type of next steps you can take in order to build more effective policies and operational practices for your business along all sorts of wellness measures. And the website is? Uh, wellnessindiana.org. And your email is? mthibodeau at indiana chamber. And you'll have to spell that, yes. right? So yeah, uh, <laughs> it's M, T as in Tom, H as in Howard, 
Howard, I as an igloo, B as in boy, I as an igloo, D as in David, E-A-U at indianachamber.com. Mike, you, you bring, as you've been so open about sharing, a personal experience firsthand of someone who had to deal with substance abuse disorder in the workplace. Now you're in this leadership role, which I don't think is any coincidence. Tell me a little bit briefly about your journey and how you, you went down into this valley, but now you've, you've come up probably a little bit wiser and certainly more empathetic and passionate about resolving and, and doing your part to solve this issue. I, um, I graduated college and then I moved on to managing political campaigns. I was pretty successful at that uh, after school and worked on some national initiatives. And I went from there to work for my international fraternity office as their director of chapter services. Uh, so managed a lot of our events and educational programming and initiatives. And then I also worked directly with our membership organizations. That was the position I was in when I got into recovery. And I will say that uh, I am very blessed to have been in a position where I got into recovery so soon. I was 26 years old and I, I'm just so grateful for that all the time because my next role after that, I, I moved in, I uh, started, we're doing entry level work at an association management company. And my group was the Indiana Construction Roundtable. And I started their entry level and within a year was moved up to executive director, managing that entire organization. I put the onus for that partly on the amazing volunteers that I worked with, the amazing mentors that I have, and a very progressive and amazing board of directors that saw something in me that they wanted to lead that organization. I was not open about my recovery in that workplace at all. They did not know I was an individual in recovery. I, they knew I didn't drink, but that's all they really needed to know. But I think that when I look at what got me from that entry level position into being ready to be an executive director, my recovery is absolutely something that enters into that. I'm a big, personally, just Dale Carnegie guy, and I do heartily believe that things like the futility of criticism, living your life in the moment, and being focused on doing what you're doing right now well has allowed me to succeed with the assistance of others. The constant presence of gratitude in my life is something that allows me to give back to those that assist me and to also recognize that in any success that I ever have, I'm not acting as myself, but I'm acting with the support of the collective group of which I'm a part of. No one, I don't believe, can ever achieve success in a vacuum. And the fact that my recovery allows me to have a mindset that allows me to see that prevents me from having things like anxiety, depression, guilt, regret. Those are things we all feel, but the, frankly, the, the mental health services I have been through have given me the tools to deal, have very healthy processing mechanisms for all of those types of things. This allows me to live in the moment and it also allows me to focus on the action at hand. You know, since I've gotten into recovery, you know, I started entry level at, at that organization. I moved up to executive director. I was the Indiana Society of Association Executives rising star for 2017. And when it came to this position, I was actually referring other people to this role. And one of my closest friends, who's the leader of the director of a statewide addictions advocacy group, who's a fellow of mine in recovery, said, why are you not going to do this? And my response was, I'm happy. I, I loved my old job. I was very happy there. I had so many meaningful relationships, many of which I, I still keep up with today. But when I gave this a shot and got in a room and started talking about it, it became immediately apparent that regardless of my satisfaction with my last role, this was a position in which I had a unique opportunity to be of service. The chamber has made a commitment to this for five years. And I said, okay, I'm in. I believe that my personal experience combined with my professional work doing workforce development and, and serving the needs of Indiana industry allow me to be in a, in a position now where I can help bridge communication gaps and allow people to be talking to each other who weren't before. And, and it's nothing I succeed I don't think is going to be because I'm doing something like groundbreaking or anything like that. It's simply because I have a lived experience that both has enough pain and enough reward that I know how to talk to people in a language that they understand. Because a lot of times in Indiana, I've, and, and I mean, our business community, that's, what, that's what's happening. We'll see events around the state where people are like, we're gonna build an event to talk to the business community about addiction issues. But they'll go there and they'll be using their addiction and their substance use and their, their healthcare jargon 
to talk to an employer population that doesn't know what they're saying and doesn't understand at least the motivation behind it. And so by us just serving as a translator, we are building things that are new, but that's just kind of coming. And the majority of what we're doing is just convening and getting people to have collaborative conversations that otherwise wouldn't be occurring. Mike, be the avatar for the employee that you were at, at the moment that you finally needed help. I woke up on a Monday morning getting ready to go to work and I got out of the shower and I walked in my living room and there were a whole bunch of people there that weren't supposed to be there. It was an intervention, a bunch of my friends and family. And they said what they said. And I said, okay, let's do this. From the treatment center that I was at, I called my employer and I told them what was going on. My employer paid me through my whole first month of treatment the same way that they did my full salary. What was their initial reaction? And, and did you talk to an HR person? Did you talk I to talked to the executive director of that organization. And so his, his reaction was actually a relief, strangely enough, because he thought that I had just stopped caring. He even told me at the time that I had been on an eventual road determination that he would have, at some point, he was trying to figure out when he was gonna have a conversation with me about an exit plan because he, he thought I just didn't care. The reality was I was in the midst of a, a extreme struggle. And so they paid me through my first month and then what happened after um, my participation in 45 days of residential care, they moved me down to part-time, 30 hours a week, so that way I could participate in outpatient care during those six weeks and they took me off the road. We did come to a mutual understanding that after about 10 months I was gonna leave and move on to a different opportunity because I did need to travel for that role. But at the time, they just decided that they were gonna make the investment in me. And after years with the organization, they decided that I, I was worth that investment in that. And so I'm forever appreciative to that. I still volunteer with that organization. I speak at their conferences. I, I do all sorts of volunteer activity to stay active and engaged and help give back because I very much enjoyed working there, but then also I uh, am very grateful for the support that they provided me. What advice do you have for a leader of a business here in Indiana that is looking at the challenges of continuing to maintain a, an active and viable workforce and is struggling maybe internally with, do I really want to take a chance with this, with people who are struggling with substance disorder. Is, is this something that, that I really want to get involved in? Because they may feel ill-equipped, they may feel very risky, they may feel all these natural emotions. What advice do you have for them? Uh, my advice would be that, you know, a year ago, there wasn't a whole lot out there that could help them, but now we've got tools. Now we've got best practices. We've built up evidence base through different companies that are having very innovative solutions throughout the country. If you are willing to take a chance and you want to engage on a solution for this issue, you don't have to go from zero to 10 tomorrow. We can talk to you about how you can get a little bit better at a time, about how you can take tiny pieces of steps with your culture and move the needle just a little bit. There are companies in Indiana that are at a 10, that are doing everything they possibly can, that are engaging, that are just doing these amazing things. However, there's a lot of other opportunities for businesses where like we can do things in pretty much any corporate structure or we can help it be a little bit better tomorrow. And at the end of the day, if that helps you retain one to two quality tenured employees, the financial impact of that is immeasurable and, and at most cases it will take zero to a very minimal investment from you to be able to make it happen. And, and really you're not just retaining employees, you're saving people's lives. Absolutely, yeah. You're playing a direct role in saving individuals' lives, saving families' lives. I mean, when we think about the impact that one person can have, it's, I mean, it's immeasurable. I think about all the people that I've assisted since in my just personal recovery since I started this journey and then now through this role, I mean, I, I'm a month into being a new dad and she never has to know that old me. And that is, whew, that is so powerful. Second chances work. Yeah, second chances work. And the studies show it. There are program after program after program across the country that have amazing outcomes. And even if you're looking at, let's say, half the people you put through a second chance program that stay, that's still a half of those people that you would have otherwise lost and had to replace. And there's financial impact for that, but then there's also just the, the impact of how does your internal culture feel about the fact that you're an environment that cares and provides assistance. We're kind of running towards the end of our conversation here. If a listener's been with us to this point and they are just struck by, how do I even make a big difference, a dent in this kind of an issue? Maybe they've had someone in their life or themselves that has dealt with this, uh, that kind of thing. 
and, and just broader challenges. You, you said yes to a big challenge and an opportunity that, that you felt called to deal with. What kind of challenge would you issue for someone who's listening, who sees a problem, wants to make a difference, but so far has talked themselves out of it? I think there's a couple different lenses to that. So the first off would be, because I think that these are the people who most often have some of the highest degrees of difficulty, is if you're a family member or a friend or a, an associate of somebody that you really care about who's struggling with this issue, my first recommendation to those people is one, self-care. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. This disease is a very broad wake and can damage a lot of people in immeasurable ways. And individuals need to make sure that as they're dealing with these things, they're talking about it. That's the other thing I would say is just make sure you're talking about it. I remember on the day that I told my mom that I was struggling with this, the first question she asked me was, what did she do wrong? That's not what she would have asked me if I had said, hey, mom, I've got diabetes. Or, hey, mom, I've, uh, I've got chronic hypertension. Or, or anything else like that, that wouldn't have, been a, it wouldn't have been her reflection. And that's not because she's uh, selfish or she did anything wrong. She didn't, she's amazing. And none of my childhood anything has to do with them. The fact is, is that she couldn't then go to her work family and say, this is what my son's dealing with because of her fear of judgment. Versus when we have family members, a lot, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to what it's like to be an adult caregiver and have to take care of an, a, a parent. When we're dealing with those struggles as individuals, we're very often transparent about those difficulties with the people we interact with in a way that we're not with this. So individuals need to take care of themselves, first and foremost. If you're an individual who's struggling with this disease, I would just say that there is hope. I know that insurance and treatment and all of these things can be so complicated. But the fact is, if you're tired of living your life the way that you are and you're ready to make a change, you don't have to go all the way there by yourself tomorrow. I remember asking a big question to myself, which was like the, like the third day in treatment or something like that, is I was like, what is my life gonna be like now? And the fact is that when I ask that question now, like my life is awesome. I couldn't even have imagined the life I have now back then. The better question I should have been asking myself and that I ask myself now, because I have the tools to do so, is what would tomorrow look like? What would tomorrow look like if I just didn't use anymore? And for most people who are in active use, that means tomorrow might look like the inside of a hospital or a medical facility, because it has to, and that's okay. But know that those tomorrows just get easier. As someone who is confronting a monster of a challenge in the workplace, where do you find your hope to get up and do this every day? What does tomorrow look like? It's the same question. This is a very big picture thing, and it would be really easy to drown in the enormity of the task that we're taking on. But from day one of this job, it's been about where can we make an impact tomorrow? And we do move the big picture things forward. That's the amazing part of doing this at a place like the Chamber is we're having policy discussions, we're having system discussions, we're talking about community health, we're doing all sorts of amazing things on all those measures. But from my perspective, where I can make a difference is even just like a week ago, I had an employer call me and they had two people that they really wanted to hire who were very qualified for the work, failed their marijuana test. We directed them to a facility where they could get a best practice course for recreational marijuana, where it's not like they didn't, you know, we're not gonna put them through rehab for recreational marijuana use. But what we can do is help provide some prevention-based and education-based best practice behaviors that at least enable them to then move into that job and start that life. Everything for all of us is always just about, when possible, course correcting. And here at this role, we have an opportunity to do that a lot. And where I see a lot of hope for this position and for our, our society is the fact that in the state of Indiana, at least, people are so used to having such collaborative conversations that we can keep moving the ball forward together without necessarily having to get siloed. And there are just some amazing partners doing amazing work all throughout the state. And, and honestly, like so much of that has to just do with Governor Holcomb. I cannot speak highly enough about the recovery-focused culture of this state all the way from his leadership down. And it starts with his leadership. There are other states that are focused on incarceration, they're focused on enforcement, they're focused on all these things. This is a state right now that is so focused on recovery and it's amazing. It makes me feel so proud to be a person in recovery that can tell my story and be part of it. And that's, that's awesome. If you had the power to make somebody remember one key takeaway from our conversation today, what would you want them to remember? I think my one takeaway from this conversation would be that you don't have to go all the way down to start picking yourself up. 
I didn't have to fall all the way. And granted, a lot of that is related to my upbringing and, and privilege. And I mean, I am a straight white man and I have all those things that I'm a college graduate. I have all those things attached to it that make it easier to not have to fall all the way down. But no matter who you are, that's all relative. And you can always self-correct and mitigate it before it goes all the way down. And even if you're an employer and you're sitting there and you're looking at a potential employee, you don't have to just say, oh, well, Mike's on the road to termination there are steps you can actively take to correct that and to get Mike back on track. And that's the tools that I like to provide. One last question. What challenge would you issue our listener here in the state of Indiana to take on their task to make the state a little bit better? Identify the words you use and how you think and how you talk about people. The state has uh, two amazing campaigns, one of which is the Know the OFAX campaign that I recommend everybody look at as far as what words to use about opioid use disorder. And another that just came out is by the Indiana Recovery Network. It's the Stigma Never Helps uh, campaign, and it's brand new. It's only about a month old, and it gives some amazing firsthand testimonials on how stigma interacts with people's lives and can prevent them from pursuing positive change. So recognize that the words you use matter, examine your biases, and if you are going through something, be willing to talk about it, because that's the only way that we break through. And that's what makes you a hopeful Hoosier. And I thank you for being on our program today. Yeah, it's fun. Indiana's business leaders and entrepreneurs now have both the legal backing and the free resources to help employees with substance misuse and substance abuse disorder make a course correction for a better and brighter future. By adopting a second chance policy, you'll give Hoosier families hope that their loved one will enter long-term recovery, just like Mike. The policy is good for business and good for people. To learn more about the Know the OFAX campaign Mike referenced, go to in.gov forward slash recovery forward slash, and I'll spell this, K-N-O-W hyphen T-H-E hyphen O. And the second Stigma Never Helps campaign he mentioned is from the Indiana Recovery Council, and you can find it at stigmaneverhelps.com. Lastly, if you'd like to learn more about the amazing program that Mike leads at Wellness Indiana, you can visit them on the web at wellnessindiana.org and then click on the Indiana Workforce Recovery link. Special thanks to my guest Mike Thibodeau and the Indiana Chamber of Commerce. If you enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll subscribe. And also, I hope you'll take a moment to leave a positive rating and comments wherever you download your podcasts. It helps us to share our hopeful message with Hoosiers wherever they are. Our theme music was composed and performed by author, speaker, therapist, and master musician, Indiana's own George Middleton. Until next episode, I'm your hopeful Hoosier host, Andy Dix, challenging you to make the difference that only you can make. Thank you for listening. The Hopeful Hoosier Podcast is a production of AD Growth Advisors Incorporated. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.